Please to welcome Howard Schubner for Talks at Google Seattle. Um, Howard is a doctor, uh, he's an internist at Providence Hospital in Michigan, and uh, also a professor at Wayne State University, College of Medicine. Uh, Michi Michigan State. Michigan State, oh yeah. We switched. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Michigan State University. Um, he's published two books now, Unlearn Your Pain and Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression. And he's coming out with a third book soon. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please welcome Howard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> That's kind, thank you. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a uniquely American story. And to borrow a phrase from a TV show that I've never seen but heard of, it's an American horror story. This is a guy, 41 years old, who I saw for low back pain, seven years. It started, he was 34, so he, he was running. Uh, he had no injury, but he started having pain in his back while he was running one day. It was kind of a dull ache, it kind of came and went. Not a big deal, but it just gradually got worse over time. Eventually it became constant, mainly on the lower left side of his spine, in the lumbar area, and then, but sometimes it would be kind of more on the right side. Sometimes it would shoot down to his butt. Uh, he started having trouble sleeping because he was in pain. There was no neurological impairment, meaning reflexes are normal, strength is normal in his legs, sensation is normal, no evidence of any nerve damage. That was good. EMG is a test to test for nerve damage. That was normal. So he had an MRI. That's going to tell us what's wrong with him, right? Maybe. He had degenerative disc disease, and he had a moderate bulge, disc bulge at L4-5. So he started to get treatment, physical therapy, another course of physical therapy, not helping, pain management specialist, injections in the spine, not helping, uh, Botox injections, piriform, piriformis injections is in the, in the butt. More injections, a TENS unit. Let's try to distract your brain from pain by giving you this electrical stimulation. He got duloxetine, that's an antidepressant. He got gabapentin, it's a nerve pill, kind of like Lyrica. Uh, someone gave him opiates. Is that a good idea? Well, but it wasn't getting better. So he said, well, I'll go another route. Let's try acupuncture, I'll take yoga. Two years later, it's, nothing's working. So this, he goes to the surgeon. The surgeon says, well, we can fix that disc, L4-5, bulging disc, no problem. He gets a fusion, L4-5. Doesn't help. Years go by. Another a year after that, another doctor says, well, your SI joint, the joint connecting the sacrum and the pelvis. SI joint's kind of like a joint connecting your ribs to your sternum. It's not much of a joint. but..." There's, a, there's some arthritis there. We can fuse that. He had that surgery. Not better. When he was 42, started having neck pain. Now we got a whole nother thing to worry about. The MRI of his neck, facet degeneration, disc space narrowing, a small disc bulge. That doesn't sound good. He goes to see the neurosurgeon. He says, well, you don't, you're, not a really, you're not a candidate for surgery in your neck. But epidural injections, he decided he already tried that in his lower back. He didn't want to do that. And his pain just continued. So he has lower back pain. He's got neck pain. And then within the last year, he started having some stomach sensations, this fluttering sensation in his stomach. So now he goes to a pain psychologist, and they give him relaxation exercises. He basically doesn't have a lot of hope of getting better at this point. That's the horror part of the story. So we have a problem in this country. More people are affected by chronic pain now than, than the combined total of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Millions of people are suffering a lot of back pain, headache pain, stomach pain, pelvic pain, widespread pain that we call fibromyalgia. Certain professions get repetitive 
strain injury, they get neck strain, they, they may have trouble with squinting because they're looking at screens all the time. Does that sound familiar? Uh, and we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the treatment is often completely ineffective. Pain management is kind of like, seems like a good idea, but do you want to really manage? Do we want to manage our pain? That's not what most people want. How many studies have shown that surgery, randomized controlled trials show that back surgery is better than either exercise or conservative therapy? How many studies have shown that surgery is better than any non-surgical intervention? Zero. Not a single study to show that. How about back injections? Large number of studies, meta-analysis of these studies, and when you compare in back injections versus placebo injections, the result, not much difference. How about opiates for pain? It's a national disaster. So let's work on the brain, psychological therapies for pain. The main psychological therapies for pain, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, none have been shown to be any better than the other. And none have been shown to be better than relaxation therapy, which is what he got. The effects are small and people continue to suffer. So what are the things that weren't taught in medical school and are still not being taught, I'm still not being taught in medical school. I'm working with three medical schools trying to get more of this into the curriculum. Well, the power of the mind and the control that our brain actually has over our experiences. A conversion disorder is when someone has a sudden onset of inability to speak or uh, paralysis of the arm or leg. And what happens is, is that the arm is paralyzed and they, you say, well, try to move it, and they can't. It's completely paralyzed. But it can, in a conversion disorder, there's no medical cause for this problem. It's psychologically induced paralysis. I saw a teenager one time who had a lot of problems uh, leading up to this, and at one point his arm just became dead. He had a huge medical workup, and he started getting better, but he would wake up in the morning, his arm would be fine, eating breakfast, drive to school, gets in the parking lot of his high school, arm dead. 3.30 in the afternoon, the bell rings, gets out of school, arm fine again. Unbelievable, the power of the brain to induce that. Can symptoms be contagious? Can you catch something from somebody called social contagion? One of the main symptoms that's been found to have social contagion is repetitive strain injury. In the 1980s in Australia, there was an epidemic of RSI. People were typing, and it got worse and worse, and more and more people got it. And at one point, the government had to step in and say, no more disability for RSI. And it started going down. <laughs> how, much, how much is typing? We had RSI since computers, so we're typing. We're going like this. Have you ever typed on a manual typewriter? You, you know what that's like? That's a lot more <laughs> strenuous, and we didn't have RSI when, we were, when people were doing that. Um, I, I know a guy who um, went to grad school, and as he was going to grad school, he was kind of tense, a lot of things going on, and he had this thought, I hope I don't get RSI. Hope I don't get RSI. Hope I don't get RSI. Guess what happened? He got RSI. <laughs> and then he's, his hand's hurting, and his arms, wrists are hurting, and it goes from one arm, goes to the other arm. And he becomes kind of incapacitated. And uh, he eventually found the work that I'm telling you about. He's fine now. But for example, I had a woman who had, and you think of structural. Everyone thinks, we think that every, all pain is structural. And I had this woman who had typing, pain with typing. Monday, Tuesday, it got worse as her week went on. By Friday, it was excruciating. So that sounds pretty structural, because the more she's typing, the more it, the more it hurts. And I asked her, does it hurt any other time? And she said, yeah, Sunday evening. Are you typing on Sunday? No. What's going on? Her brain is anticipating it. And that was the moment. That's the house moment. I go back to the 70s, the Columbo moment, the Sherlock Holmes moment where you go, okay, now we know what this is. And she's fine now. 
How many of you have regular hallucinations? Is that common? Not really. So, yeah, join the group. <laughs> we don't think of, we think of hallucinations as, as being crazy. But how many of you have had the experience where you felt the vibration of your cell phone in your pocket when it wasn't vibrating? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's a hallucination. One study showed 90% of college students had that hallucination. The brain commonly creates a whole range of experiences that I'm going to talk to you about. And do you know where you hold stress in your body? Do you know when you're stressed? Where you feel it in your body? Do you have any sense of that? Most people do. But we don't think, we think of that as a different category than what this guy I was telling you about has because his problem is severe. So our brains construct our experience. Vision is constructed. Have you ever tried to find an icon on your cell phone when it was in a slightly different place? Or when you're not expecting the color or whatever it is, you don't know exactly where it is and you're looking at it, but you can't see it. We see with our visual cortex. And about 10% of the fibers that go to our visual cortex come from our eyes, from the retina. 90% come from within our brain. I'm sure you've seen this picture before. What do you see? It's interesting how what we see is actually a neural pathway, kind of what we expect to see. Can you switch it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Does everyone see there's a younger woman and the older woman? And can you switch it? Can you just try to look at one? Or do sometimes you get stuck in, stuck in one mode? Oftentimes we get stuck in one mode and we have to say, what mode are you stuck in? If you're stuck, which one, the older or the younger? See, the, the chin of the older woman is down here, and the nose of the younger woman is up here, and her ear is there. And so, as soon as you see it, then your brain can shift. When people see an eyewitness, when people are, are an eyewitness to a crime, who do they pick out of the lineup? They pick out the person that their brain tells them is most likely to have committed the crime based on their understanding of crime and criminals. And that's been shown. So now we talk about pain. This looks painful. A friend of mine inadvertently shot a nail in his hand. He had zero pain. Pain only occurs if the brain activates a danger alarm mechanism. No danger alarm mechanism, no pain. Kids skin their knee and cry. Other times they skin their knee and don't cry. Or they cry when they see a concerned parent running. Our brain has to activate pain in order to experience pain. The body can't, doesn't send pain signals to the brain. It sends signals, and our brain has to interpret if that signal is actually a danger or not. Our brain controls pain. All pain is in the brain. This guy was written up in the British Medical Journal, jumped off a scaffolding onto a nail, nail impaled itself through his boot, rushed him to the hospital, a lot of pain. They hurriedly took his boot off. What did they find? The nail was positioned precisely between his toes, no injury at all. His brain had activated pain as a warning mechanism, but it was completely mistaken about the risk. I met a doctor a few years ago who told me this story. He was in the Vietnam War as a young man. His company got ambushed one day. He took shrapnel wound to his leg, had a lot of pain, got medevaced out. Comes home stateside, his injuries heal. What happens to injuries? All injuries heal. His brain turned off the danger alarm mechanism, and now he's fine. 20 years later, roughly, he's walking down the street. He gets startled by the sound of a helicopter coming up from behind, and he gets the same pain in his leg after all those years. How do we snap our fingers? How do we ride a bike? How do we do silly things like that? These things happen because our brain forms connections. Millions of brain cells connect themselves into neural circuits or a neural pathway for a specific purpose. That's how we live our lives. And his brain learned pain from the injury, remembered it all those years as a neural pathway, and then activated it later in life upon the mental association of the helicopter. We now know that when someone gets an emotional injury, the parts of the brain that are activated are identical to those that happen when someone gets a physical injury. 
This is the mechanism by which emotional pain can cause physical pain. And children who grow up feeling unsafe for whatever reason, parental abuse or neglect or all sorts of things that can happen to children, the feeling of growing up unsafe sensitizes that danger and alarm mechanism in the brain that then can be activated later in life by another life stressful event or by a physical injury such as a car accident. And so the, this whole variety of pain syndromes that are the commonest pain syndromes we have are all associated with childhood adversity. And when you scan the brain of people who have uh, chronic back pain, who have back pain, what happens is uh, over, this is, these are people who have back pain that was persistent, chronic, and the somatosensory areas of the brain go down to normal but the emotional laden areas of the brain go up. In chronic pain, it's not particularly a physical problem for most people, which is shocking. And so there's this whole range of syndromes that all hang together. The chance that a tension or migraine headache is due to a structural problem in the brain is two or three percent. The vast majority of people with tension, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, most pelvic pain syndromes do not have structural problems in, the, in, in their body. And studies show that approximately 85% of people with neck or back pain do not have a clearly identifiable structural cause for that pain, 85%. And that's shocking. So what happens is, is that you may have somebody who's, let's say their father was, I'll exaggerate a little, they're, not you, me, <laughs> their father, my father, <laughs> talking about me now, <laughs> was you know, kind of critical and could be judgmental, a little bit harsh, and you have a sensitive young boy growing up in that environment. It certainly wasn't abusive, but the danger pathway becomes a little bit sensitized. And then uh, you get to internship, so the first day of my internship, I'm a terrified young doctor. Uh, I start getting diarrhea, lasts for six months. Something about being a doctor simply scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and so the danger mechanism then is producing a symptom. Then, then I decide, oh, here's a good idea. I'll have kids. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to get promoted in my job. I'll, I'll start doing research. Uh, I'll start working on national committees. Great idea. All these things are great ideas, but they cause stress. And then my neck starts to hurt. And I wake up in the morning and I go to work like this. Have you ever seen anybody go to work like this? It's pretty common. And what do they all say? I slept on it wrong. That's what I said for years. And my MRI shows these bulging discs and arthritis and all this stuff. And I still have these bulging discs in my brain, but in my neck, but I don't have any pain now. And then, what if <clears throat> I get in a little car accident? Bender, bender. And then I begin to get other things or something else happens in your life. And then it can just spiral from there. Because what happens is that the experience of having pain further activates the danger alarm mechanism, which activates more pain. So having, it's a vicious cycle of pain leading to fear of pain leading to more pain. And that describes why many people with chronic pain get worse over time. And their pain tends to spread like from their lower back to their middle back or to their neck or to their belly like the guy that I was telling you about. And so what I explain to people is injuries send signals to the brain and the, the brain has to decide. When I say the brain, these are processes that are happening completely outside of our conscious awareness. That's why American Horror Stories is an apt analogy because the people move into this house that's haunted and everything is out of control. Things are happening to them. And people stuck in this spiral like the patient I was telling you about feel like things are happening to them that are completely outside of their control. And it's their brain that is doing it at a subconscious level. And emotional injury can activate the danger signal in exactly the same way as physical injury. And then pain becomes learned as a neural pathway. So when I evaluate patients with pain, and there's other 
I should mention other things that are connected to this. So people with uh, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, depression uh, are common ones. But if we're talking about pain, we're trying to, uh, my job, number one, is, is this a structural problem? Like, you know, you got a, you fell on your wrist, it's broken, you need a cast? Or is it a neural pathway problem? Because pain is a message that our brain is giving us. It's our job to encode it. I saw a woman a few years ago who had pain in her, her butt right here. And I said, well, when did it start? She said, well, right about the time my husband retired. And if you think about it, you guys aren't thinking about it. <laughs> Are you thinking about it? <laughs> That's a very different message. So my first job is to rule out a structural disorder. The guy that we're talking about, he had had everything done to him that could be done structurally. Nothing had helped. He had a bulging disc. They already fixed it. They fixed things that weren't even broken. And so there's no evidence. He had no evidence of nerve damage. There was no evidence that he had a structural problem. So now my second job is to say, well, if we can rule out a structural problem, maybe we can rule in a neural pathway or a brain-induced problem. Well, this is a very important slide. It's a meta-analysis, 3,300 people, a bunch of studies lumped together. If you take completely healthy, pain-free 30-year-olds and you give them MRIs, 50% of them have disc degeneration. 40% have bulging discs, completely pain-free. If you take 50-year-olds, those numbers are 80% and 60%. And if you get to be the ripe old age like me, we're talking about 90% of people have degenerative disc, DDD, degenerative disc disease, like it's a disease. The vast majority of adults have abnormal MRIs that are not the cause of pain. And doctors don't know what to, doctors know this information, it's not a secret. They just don't know what to do with it, how to interpret it, how to apply it in general. And so what, was, what, is, what were the messages that this patient that I was telling you about was getting from his doctors? The messages were, you're damaged. There's a problem here. It might be genetic. We don't know. We tried to fix it, but we couldn't fix it, which leads to no hope. No hope leads to more pain because of the vicious cycle. So what are the clues? So we're looking at how many, do, do people have a variety of symptoms over time? It was, it was headaches, and then it was stomach pain, and then it was back pain, or neck pain, or insomnia. Do people have adverse childhood events that maybe has primed that danger alarm mechanism in their brain? And do people have this tendency to want to please, to be perfectionistic, to care what other people think about them, to be overly conscientious and responsible, kind of like you guys, kind of like me. And that's good. These are the best people in the world. But the, when we put more pressure on ourselves, we have more tendency to activate this fear and danger mechanism, the alarm, danger alarm mechanism. And then we're looking at what was going on in, in your life or the, their life at the time that this that symptom A started at the time that symptom B started, et cetera. And then we're looking at a distribution pattern from a medical point of view. Someone has pain that starts in the left top of the head, the left side, it goes all the way down to the left torso, all the way down to the left leg. There's no disease that does that. There's no disease that has pain from in the morning and then it goes away by two in the afternoon and then it's gone the rest of the day. There's no disease that does that. And so we have to understand that we can evaluate people and rule in brain-induced pain. So what happens with an injury? You get an injury, it hurts, and then it gets better over two days or five days or a couple weeks. Fractures take six weeks to heal. But what we see, and, and you can diagnose people in, in your family and friends very easily by saying, oh, I got an injury and never healed. Well, how likely is that? Probably not. If the pain is continuing and worsening over time after a fairly mild injury, that's not the normal pattern. That's not, that's not structurally induced pain. The pain shifts from one area of the body to another. Fibromyalgia is classic for that. The pain is in the arms and then the next day it's in the legs. It can shift on a dime because neural pathways can turn on and turn off, which is the beauty of what I do because people can get better. Uh, symptoms spread, as I mentioned, often bilateral. The brain often says, well, I hurt my right, my right wrist and now my left wrist is hurting. 
That's a red flag for me. Uh, social contagion, we talked about that. There's a study from Germany. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989, I believe. In 1991, they started studying back pain in East Germany and West Germany, these two populations. And the West German back pain was up here and the East German back pain was down here. And over time, the East German back pain just rose to the level of West German back pain as those cultures mixed. And the conclusion of the article was that back pain is a contagious disorder. Interesting. Not all cultures have the amount of back pain that we have in this culture. A friend of mine was a doctor in Iraq. And when he came here, he said, why does everyone have back pain here? People don't come to the doctor for back pain in Iraq. I know, maybe they have other problems, but they did come to the doctor for, for their other problems. They just didn't come for back pain. So that's, what, that's the kind of work that I do. So back to this guy, our friend. He's an engineer. He's from Detroit, so everyone's an engineer, but not a computer engineer, an auto engineer. Of course, a lot of auto engineers actually are computer engineers now. His wife works part-time, he's got two kids. He didn't have a particularly adverse uh, childhood, but he was sensitive. He noticed he had stomach pains before he had to do school presentations. Uh, the onset of his headaches and the, and the, and the buttock pain co coincided with his first position in his new job. The marriage was rocky at times. Uh, but about eight years ago, when the back pain started, which spread to neck pain, his company was sold, increase in workload, concerned about keeping his job, it was a recession, puts a lot of pressure on stuff. He started going to work 7 a.m., and then 6 a.m., and then 5 a.m., and he started getting pain because his brain was sending him a message. So here's the kicker for him. He goes on vacation, pain goes away. That's solid evidence. He, was, he spent a week camping on a hard ground and his back was fine. And that tells me everything that I need to know. The other thing he noticed is, is that he noticed, he didn't notice that his back pain was worse in stressful situations, but he did notice that his stomach discomfort was related to stressful situations at work or at home. And he also noticed when his stomach hurt, his back didn't hurt. And that's another more positive evidence for neural pathway pain. I want to shift gears for a second. This is a study we published uh, last week. Uh, it's an NIH-funded trial. It was directed by an extraordinary colleague that I have, Mark Lumley, at Wayne State University. And we randomized 230 people with fibromyalgia who have severe and chronic pain but no tissue damage in the body to three groups. And this was a three-arm study. The first group, the first arm got education for fibromyalgia as a control group. The second arm got the standard pain psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, done by our excellent colleagues at University of Michigan, specifically designed for fibromyalgia. And the third arm was an arm that Mark and I devised. And we based it on the work of one of our colleagues, Dr. Alan Abbas. And in this group, we talk to people about the connection between emotions and pain. And we ask them to do the difficult work of looking at recognizing, experiencing, expressing, and processing emotions that they may have avoided in their life, such as anger, guilt, sadness, and compassion. And we didn't know if people were really going to engage in this kind of thing anyway, because it's not the standard. It's not cognitive behavioral therapy. The idea is to help you cope better with the pain. But we're talking about getting to an underlying mechanism. What we found was striking. At a six-month follow-up after the treatment, the treatment, the people in the emotional expression and awareness group had significantly higher rates of dramatic, more than 50% pain reduction compared to the other two groups. And I don't know if you know, I, I, uh, how much you know about medical statistics, but the number needed to treat was seven. So if you go to your doctor and your cholesterol is high and you've never had a heart attack, your cholesterol is high and your doctor says, here, I want you to take this, this medication to lower your cholesterol. What's the chance that that medication will actually help you? In that situation, the number needed to treat is 100. That means one out of 100 is, would be likely to not get the heart attack. So that, we do that every day. This is a number needed to treat of seven. It's a very powerful effect in terms of medical interventions. 
And we also found that uh, changes in widespread pain index, the emotional awareness and expression arm was better than the CBT arm. And in terms of the percentage of people who actually still met the criteria for the disorder at the end of the study was, was uh, much less in the emotional expression arm. This is the first large-scale study to our knowledge to show that one psychological intervention for pain is actually superior to any other psychological intervention. So what have we learned? Well, a lot of people with pain have issues in their lives from childhood and onward. Pain is connected to emotions. And this kind of therapy does better than the standard. And this, we think, is a landmark study in a lot of ways. And this study doesn't even include the whole range of therapy that I'm going to talk to you about that we give for this guy. This is another study, just an outcome study we published from data from my, uh, my work and my program. And in these people with half, roughly half with back pain, half with fibromyalgia, the average duration of pain was nine years. The average duration of pain in this sample was nine years. And these people, when they go to pain management clinics, usually don't get much in the way of actual pain reduction. But in our sample, two-thirds of them had at least 30% pain reduction, and over half had more than 50% pain reduction. So it's a different paradigm. The paradigm that all pain is due to injury in the body and is simply reflected in the brain is not working for people with brain-induced symptoms. We need a different paradigm. And if you're aware of the history of science, paradigms don't shift easily. It can take decades for a paradigm, for an idea that initially seems completely counterintuitive to go to totally obvious. Plate tectonics, the idea that the continents were all together in one thing, you can see, if you look at the map, you can see how they fit together like a puzzle, right? It took 50 years for scientists to agree that that's what had happened, 50 years. And it's obvious, you can see it. So the symptoms of this disorder are real, but they're not damaging. The brain has been sensitized, and the brain has the power to produce even very severe symptoms. And most people have this, at least to some degree. It's a very common phenomenon. We believe that the majority of people with chronic pain have this phenomenon and are being treated by an old paradigm. Yet skepticism continues to abound. What do we do? The interventions are straightforward and inexpensive. The most important one is understanding that this is what's going on because people who, who get it, who understand like, oh my goodness, I'm not damaged, I'm not broken, I can get better, that allows them to do the work of detaching from the symptoms Whereas people who are under the belief that they're actually damaged, it's very hard to do that. And so the idea is that they, people need to really understand, and that's why I spend so much time examining people and, and listening to their story and looking for those details that are going to make or break the case, so to speak. So this is a woman who I never met. Uh, she says, 21 months post-op, third back surgery, three-level fusion, doesn't sound good, 21 months trying every therapy to get out of enormous, unrelenting back pain, on top of 22 years of chronic, limiting back pain, no success. My doctor sent me a leak to your website. That's my website. Six days. I considered the possibility that this could apply to me. I came back, I read it again. I said, oh my God, that's me. I see it. It's obvious. Shift paradigm shift. And what happened to her pain? It just went down. Most people don't have that kind of response, but when you have the response that you actually get it and you see the paradigm shift and you see what's going on, then you have the opportunity to get better, to get completely better. And, and she had a dramatic effect just from understanding and learning about this model. And then she said, well, I started walking. Before, I could barely walk around the building, but I kept telling myself. What did she tell herself? I can walk. I can walk. I'm okay. I'm not damaged. And she starts walking. And she says, wow, forgive me for being effusive, but from going from crippled, fearful, bewildered, discouraged, bordering on despair to regaining my life, this 
It's kind of a minor miracle. So once people get the idea and understand what's going on, then they can begin to reduce the danger alarm mechanism. They can begin to worry less about the pain, stop anticipating it, stop monitoring it, stop allowing the pain to dominate their every thought and every action, begin to re-engage in physical and social activities despite pain, knowing that they actually can, knowing that they're not damaged, knowing that they can get better. I'm going to talk about mindfulness in a minute. So this is a woman, she said, I had a huge success today. I was determined to go for a walk, but my back was killing me. So I said to my brain, I'm going for a walk today. You can, make, you can either make this easy or you can make this difficult, but we're going. It's kind of like those old gangster movies where they say, you're going to talk. <laughs> you can either make it easy or difficult, but you're going to talk. And she's saying to her brain, look, this is how it's going to be. We have the ability to change our neural pathways because the brain is neuroplastic. As we think differently, as we act differently, we can soothe the brain and calm that danger alarm mechanism, which is kind of like calming a child who's really upset. And if you keep doing it and you keep working at it, what happens is most people get better. And then there's emotion-focused techniques. And I don't have time to talk too much about that. But one of the simplest things that anybody can do is get out a piece of paper and start writing. You can write a letter to anybody you want, dead or alive, and you can shred it. So you can say anything you want. And it's a very uh, healing uh, process. This is a woman who wrote to me. This is a woman in Germany who was uh, working this program. And uh, she said, well, I did my first writing exercise. Tears streaming down my face. I was finished. My whole body was screaming with pain. No, you can't stand facing that. So she had activated emotions and her pain went from here to here. And then she did something brilliant. She wrote a letter to her brain saying, yes, I can face it. I'm capable of doing this. It's okay. I am allowing myself to feel emotions. We're afraid of emotions often and we avoid them at all costs. And then her pain just dissipated as she did this work. It's amazing. <clears throat> and this kind of thing, it's, it's very hard to, it's really hard to understand unless it's actually happened to you. What's happened to you, you go, oh my God, that's unbelievable. But in the abstract, it's like, yeah, that's probably true for other people, but that's, my pain's real. And so mindfulness. So mindfulness is everywhere. I've been a teacher of mindfulness for 17 years now, and I'm passionate about it. I think everyone should learn mindfulness. But the data on mindfulness for chronic pain shows it has small effects. It's not particularly effective. And the reason is the same reason that cognitive behavioral therapy suffers, because we're not looking at the underlying cause. So we're using mindfulness to cope better with chronic pain, as opposed to understanding that mindfulness can actually be the key to, to relieving it, to resolving it, once you know that it's actually a product of the mind. If the pain is a product of the mind, then mindfulness works because now you're noticing it with detachment. Now you're noticing it, you're tolerating it, you're accepting it, and it doesn't bother you. You don't care as much anymore, and that turns off the danger alarm mechanism. It's a very powerful intervention. And then lastly, sometimes people need to make changes in their life. They need to do something. If you're in a, you know, if, 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 you're, if there's a difficult marriage or a job or neighbor situation or something, sometimes you have to take action and deal with it as best as possible. So what about our, our friend? Well, initially it was kind of hard. It's like, I, people have been telling me for eight years how damaged I am, how bad my back is. And it takes time to go over the evidence and explain and apply it and personalize it and to care and to show that you actually care and that, that you're doing everything that you can. And when he sees that, he's much more likely to understand that, to trust you and believe you. And so he started doing that work. And he had his ups and downs. Initially, his pain got worse as he started to do this work because he's shaking things up in this danger alarm, like the woman with the writing. But he persisted in the conviction that he wasn't damaged, that he could get better. And about four months later, he was 
basically pain-free. He was fine after eight years. Back pain, neck pain, and uh, stomach pain, all caused by the same underlying mechanism. And these would recur at odd times. Every now and then, all of a sudden, he would get an ache or a twinge or whatever. And what's going on? His brain just going like, oh, neuropath, I remember that. Zing. And then you get the pain. But he knows what it is now. He doesn't, he doesn't immediately go to fear or frustration or worry. He says, oh, that's my brain. No big deal. Goes on. Goes away. Or when he has a stressful life event, the pain comes as a message. We need pain. Pain is very important. And so it's, it serves as a protective mechanism. Children who grow up without the ability to feel pain often die at an early age. So we need pain. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, in, in his case, he's got a great barometer. Whenever his stomach's bothering him, he's going like, oh, maybe I should check out what's going on in my life because something, something's bothering me, and that's a gift. So research now confirms that all pain is a protective mechanism via neural pathways. It can be triggered by structural disorder or by simply the neural pathways in the brain. And a significant proportion of pain that we have is brain-induced. MRI findings are often not correlated with pain. And we can make this distinction between structural pain versus non-structural pain, or sometimes it's a combination of the two because the treatments are radically different. And reversal of this syndrome can occur when you combine an understanding of it, when you combine the cognitive, behavioral, and the emotional interventions, the results can be dramatic. So as I said, paradigms don't shift easily. As Sherlock Holmes said, there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. You, just hearing what you heard today, and maybe you knew all this stuff, but you will run into people with this syndrome frequently. It's that common. And it's easy to recognize when you just know what you're looking for. And how are most people going to react if you happen to mention it? Disbelief and outright rejection. That's what happens. But the more people who understand pain the way you do now, the more likely the paradigm will shift. Uh, this uh, website, the TMS Wiki, is a nonprofit website, clearinghouse for information on this. The next, uh, the next uh, URL is for a three-minute uh, animated video made by my colleague, Alan Gordon. And there's a bunch of books that all explain this. And eventually, what happens a lot of times is people initially reject the idea, but then they hear about it from somebody. And then somebody else happens to mention it. Somebody else happens to mention it. Eventually, they take a look. And eventually, they look at themselves. And it's hard to do to self-reflect. But the bottom line is that the reign of pain lies mainly in the brain. So <laughs> thank you for letting me be here. And I'll be happy to um, answer questions. <clears throat> yeah? How can we help our children not fall into these patterns in the first place? Yeah, you know, they got to find their own, find their own way. <laughs> well, ch I mean, children uh, mirror what their parents do. And if the parent has always got a bad back, that's going to set up in the kid's mind like, oh yeah, when I have a problem, my back will start hurting. So we have to be careful about that. Um, we have to be careful about um, uh, giving a pill for everything. There was a woman in Maryland who came up with Obicalp, which is placebo spelled backward to give to kids when they had a tummy aches, to give them a pill that's a placebo. Like, why would you do that? I have a friend who <clears throat> was in, on vacation with his son, and his parents were divorced, and they were doing this hike, and the kid's stomach started hurting. And they're going like, what did you eat? You know, through every physical thing that you could think of, and finally he's... Finally says, okay, I gotta ask, I gotta say, you know, is there something bothering you, buddy? No, no, everything's fine. Okay, is there something bothering you, buddy? No, no, everything's fine. Something on your mind? He goes, I miss my mom. And so just the idea of understanding that, and he goes, yeah, I miss my, yeah, I miss her too, but you'll be seeing her soon, and we'll write her a letter, and we'll FaceTime her tonight or whatever, and, and then he's running around, and he's fine. And so, 
the more we understand, the more we can bring our kids up to understand. Other questions? Yeah. Is there, are there other methods that you found that we can use to like reframe the way that we interpret structural pain? Are you, are you saying that can we, can we use the, the mind to help structurally induce pain? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, well, you can use the same things. I mean, the brain, you know, a guy with the nail in his hand, the brain can actually reduce structural pain. And so when someone, studies show, for example, when someone gets a pain that, we, we, someone gets a pain that's intentional, it hurts a lot more than if it's accidental. And we know that, um, uh, something else I was going to tell you. Uh, we know that you can, toler you can tolerate a severe pain if you think it's for a short time, but it's almost intolerable to tolerate a minor pain if you think it's forever. And so framing how we view the pain uh, as how, how damaging is it and how much can we do and how much do we want to focus on living our life as opposed to letting the pain dominate us. So at least what we can do with structural pain is at least hopefully prevent it from falling into the vicious cycle of it getting worse and worse over time because of increased fear, monitoring, anticipation, and worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. In that example you gave of the, uh, the, uh, the helicopter uh, from the pain from the shop mill, yeah, yeah, the 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 veteran, the Vietnam veteran. So it sort of came back in a very small period of time. Yeah. How does he solve that? It was that kind of. It was just uh, it, it came and went. You know, his brain just turned it on for that moment by that association. Uh, so that for him it wasn't it wasn't an ongoing pain. It was just a short lived. It just showed. It's just as a great illustration of how the brain learns pain, remembers pain, and then can activate it. A lot of pain is triggered. It becomes a conditioned response. So I say, I know it. I know I have a problem with my back because every time I turn here. But the way the brain works is a, is a model called predictive coding. So if the brain thinks something's going to happen, it will create it. So we used to think that when you stand up, that as you stood up, there's a sensor in the carotid artery that would send signals to the brain to say, oh, you're standing up. Brain, send more blood to the brain so, you don't, so we don't faint. It turns out. When you think about standing up, the brain activates that mechanism. So the brain is predicting ahead of time what, you're gonna, what it needs to do. And so every time you bend over, your brain is predicting pain, and it will do it. So people with typing, the brain is predicting pain with typing. Brain is predicting pain when they're sitting. And these are conditioned responses, Pavlovian responses, actually that we can work to eradicate. I, used to, I had a lot of back pain, and every time I bend over, it hurt, and I just when I figured out that it wasn't my back, every time I bent over, I just said to myself, I'm fine, I'm okay, this won't hurt. And I re you do that enough times and your brain finally gets the message and it turns off that conditioned response. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is there any concern that this kind of treatment will impair people from feeling necessary or useful pain? Uh, you can't stop pain. I mean, <laughs> people get pain all the time. The main thing is that people always ask, we say, well, how do I know if it's real or not? You know, how do I know? And we use common sense. If you fell, you hurt yourself. And when I get pain, you know, and I don't know what it is, I go to the doctor and try to make sure. But, you know, with common sense, if it's not getting better or, you know, we, you know, just kind of investigate it, uh, then you can tell. But uh, pain's not going away anytime soon. There's... <laughs> We, that mechanism is pretty well, pretty well wired, so to speak. So I have a couple more things I can tell you, a couple more little stories, if you don't mind. And then we can wind up. We'll be on time. We'll be even early. So I, I uh, flew here yesterday from Detroit. Get up early in the morning, get in my car, drive to the airport, get on the plane. Everything's fine. I'm on the plane. I'm walking up and down. I get my bag, get in the car, get to the hotel, I f everything's fine. I get out of the car at my hotel and I start walking and all of a sudden I have this sharp pain in the bottom of my toe, my big toe on my right foot. It's like a needle is sticking in it. This is a sharp pain. And it, every time I step down, it hurts. I'm like, what the heck? How could, what could possibly be wrong 
from all day, I was fine, and all of a sudden I've got this needle-like pain. So my mind-body doctor brain is going like, okay, what's wrong? You know, you don't, you don't like the hotel, or you're giving a talk tomorrow, maybe you're nervous about that, you know, what, what, what's going on? And then my, um, my medical doctor side says, you know, God, it feels like you got something in your foot, <laughs> right? And then my, uh, my human side says, dang, this hurts. So I go up, and I get into the hotel, I'm at the registration, I check in, and I'm standing there, and then I put a little pressure on my toe, and it's fine. And I push harder on it, and it's fine, like it's gone away. I'm thinking like, okay, that was my brain, because why would it, if it was something there, it wouldn't just go away like that. So I get my key, I go up in my room, I'm walking, now it starts hurting again every step, and by the time I got to my room, I'm walking on my heel, because I don't want to put any pressure on my big toe. And so I get inside the room and I, do a di I perform a diagnostic test. What was the test? Look. So I pull off my shoe, there's, and this is what I found. A shard of glass <laughs> sticking in my sock. How the heck did it not bother me the whole, all day until I just got there? But as we say, you know, you got to look. you got to rule out structural causes first. I was giving a lecture, I was thinking about this the other day, I gave a lecture a couple years ago in, in London actually, and at the end this guy got up and he said, in my culture, pain is viewed as a gift from God. What do you think about that? And I go, well, yeah, it is. However we were formed, we have this ability to have pain. And it's a barometer of our, of our structural body and it's a barometer of our brain and all the experiences that we bring to this moment. And when pain occurs, or other symptoms that I mentioned, when pain occurs, something's going on and it's our job to encode it. It's our job to learn from it. And it's a complete gift. And people who've been through, like this guy, He's going to be so much better in his life because now he understands himself better. He understands what triggers him. What are some of the issues in his life? He can take action and do the work to, to deal more effectively with what life brings. And sometimes people need to make big changes in their life, but, but there's an experience that is not that well known, which is post-traumatic growth. Not all trauma leads to post-traumatic stress disorder. Trauma can lead to post-traumatic growth if we know how to use it, if we know how to interpret it, and if we have the tools to help us grow as people. And I think that's kind of what life is all about. So with that, I'll leave you, and thanks a lot. Thank you.